special presentation of LOBF with archaeologists Dr. Lawrence Garrity and Dr. Doug Clark, Excavating the Bible. Welcome to this edition of Excavating the Bible, What Archaeology Can Teach Us. This program is dedicated to exploring the contributions of Middle Eastern archaeology to our understanding of and appreciation for the Bible. I'm Doug Clark, director of the Center for Near Eastern Archaeology at La Sierra University, and joining me as co-host, Dr. Larry Garrity, also from La Sierra University, with a lifelong <laughs> interest, um, personally and professionally, in mm -hmm. archaeology. Mm -hmm. And joining us is uh, Dr. Kent Bramlett, associate assistant professor, working on associate <laughs> professor <laughs> of uh, archaeology and the history of antiquity at La Sierra, and curator of our labs of our collections at the university, and chief archaeologist, co-director of our excavations in Jordan. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. You. We have talked um, about artifacts. I have a series of three on my favorite artifact. And Kent, you were able to talk with some enthusiasm about cooking pots. Mostly, I think, because they broke a lot, so you had lots of pieces. <laughs> right, right, so you right. had lots of uh, examples that change quite regularly over time. Yeah. You could sort them out more mm -hmm. quickly. And Larry, you talked about lamps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would like to talk about, and I don't know, uh, this seems like, I mean, it's, it is one of my favorite uh, artifacts, and those are uh, milling stones. Uh, now, why did you choose that? Of all the possible <laughs> things to choose, you, you chose these stones. These stones, that's right. <laughs> well, and we're, we're going to talk about the stones that are on the tables in front of us. These stones represent life. Mm -hmm. um, cooking pots mm -hmm. represent life. Mm -hmm. uh, lamps, I think it could do with death and life lamps. both. I well, guess. okay, <laughs> because they were certainly used. Well, both yeah, lamps right, and cooking symbols. pots right. are powerful symbols, and they were both used in burials too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have something going on in life and in mm -hmm. death. But I think that um, these stones, they're interesting because they're very utilitarian. Mm -hmm. um, they are ubiquitous. They're mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. And by everywhere, I don't mean everywhere in Israel, Palestine, Jordan. They're everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the kinds of grinding stones, the milling stones, um, everybody ground wheat or some kind of crop into flour in time. Yeah. And in the process, needed stones to do it. Um, and in the process of putting stone against stone, also added to the diet some minerals <laughs> well, did, yes. and added to what one chewed, mm -hmm. some uh, grinding of mm -hmm. the teeth, uh, some you can dentition. See the on yes. Agricultural peoples compared to mm -hmm. to, um, to, to hunters, hunter gatherers. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and in fact, people would say that we can we can talk about, we can look for, we can see evidence of some of these major transitions mm -hmm. in human history, and one of them has to do with grinding. Um, is are it there the special kind of stones that are used? What kinds of stones work best well, for grinding? The, at least in our neck of the woods, in the southern Levant, um, it is a, a type of lava. It's a basalt stone. It's a basalt. Mm -hmm. And one can see that these um, particular implements have little holes in them. These are the bubbles from the cooling of mm -hmm. the basalt. Mm -hmm. uh, some basalt has larger ones. We call those vesicular. Mm -hmm. We have to have these scientific terms <laughs> to describe them. Right. Um, the finer ones are the smaller ones. And so basalt was used a so lot. They would choose the kind of basalt they mm -hmm. wanted for different purposes. They, absolutely, they would. And as we look at some of these, we will see that some of the basalt is very fine, and some of it is more vesicular, has the larger holes. And of course, you would get more grit. Um, if you're using the big ones, because they, yeah, yeah. they would be a rougher grind. Now, and not all of these are basalt that you have on no, the table. No, that's correct. In fact, um, we have a couple that um, are limestone. Well, there's a small stone over there that's limestone. And then this stone, not the little pestle, but this mortar, what we call a mortar. And this is how we keep track of them. This is the official tag that follows this one around. It has the number on the bottom somewhere. Mm, I'm looking for it. I don't see it right off. Uh, these typically have the number that we then have on a tag. These are computerized, so we know everything about them and where they came from that we excavated. Mm -hmm. um, those that are part of our collection that have been donated to us, uh, we don't have all of that mm -hmm. information for them. Um, but now if we look at these, just what we have here, 
we have stone tools. And what, what I'm thinking about as a broad category of my favorite is ground stone mm -hmm. tools. So these are tools that have been, in one way or another, uh, shaped for a function. And most of them are quite domestic, quite utilitarian, not decorative, um, but useful in households. So let me just so say a couple stone, things. Not, what's the alternative? Not chipped or flaked? Exactly, stone, right? or carved. Or carved. Um, okay. Now, these may have had some initial carving done on them, but the grinding is what gives them their mm -hmm. shape and what makes them useful over time. Why don't you go through and tell us what the function of each of these was and how, how you know? If, if I could tell you the function of all of them, I would. And then I could give you the rationale, but um, we'll do what we can. Okay. Some of them are really questions, and I'll come to one of them over here mm -hmm. in a bit. Um, but uh, if we look at some of them, the small ones coming from the right-hand side, that's a good question. Is that just a smooth, uh, small limestone? Is it a, is it a chert nodule uh, mm -hmm. within limestone, which, which would make it very hard, yeah. but which would also make it natural? So what would you use it for? Well, how, how about could, David and Goliath? Story? Well, would that, that would that would fly pretty well. <laughs> that would fly. Yeah. What would what would show up as stones in uh, in in gizzards in some of these large yeah, that's, birds? That's what I was thinking. Ostrich. We know there were mm -hmm. ostriches there. Right. Mm -hmm. The gizzard stones are round pebbles that are quite polished. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's fine wear on this one. Yeah, there is some. It could be. Because they just keep churning and right. churning against yeah. each other and in the process yeah. do the grinding. And then some small little, um, You've got th like these that. would be like a pestle, yes, and we have another one here. And when you check it, that should be fairly smooth on the bottom if you mm -hmm. feel it. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. you feel it there. It's very smooth. This one's very smooth on the bottom. Um, and this has our, our number. This is from our site at, in Jordan. This one is a small a cute little thing fine specimen. and it is a fine specimen and it's also fairly fine basalt mm -hmm. um, there are some larger holes in it but most of it's fairly small even has a kind of a finger grip mm -hmm. here and when you feel this is as smooth as they get even mm -hmm. though it has some of this uh, larger uh, mm -hmm. holes and even on the top so this has been used both ways mm -hmm. Um, and that or what spices you think or cosmetics uh, um, it could have been both probably these are tied to food preparation mm -hmm. which of course is part of this larger issue of food and how much time it took to mm -hmm. to gather and to care for and to prepare and to consume and to store and so on uh, these are a part of that major food system tell us about this one this one is another one um, like that, a, a, a pestle of some kind that you would, you could, you could do some fairly, especially with this one, you'd do some fairly fine mm -hmm. materials, some herbs and so on. This one's a bit more coarse. Mm -hmm. This one has a nice grip on mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. uh, but this one is not nearly as worn as that one. So this one didn't. Could, have could you put a rope around that with a handle and use it as a pounder of some kind? Um, these are often, if, there are, if this was for a rope, and it's not impossible, would be used for a weight. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and maybe that's the case. Mm -hmm. Maybe um, Americans <coughs> use rooms like that for fishing, but I don't right. think we had a lot of freshwater no. <laughs> streams in this area. No. Not too many fish in the Dead Sea. Right. right. <laughs> but we do need to think about these particular implements as multi-purpose right. implements. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, people did not waste anything. Mm -hmm. And there was no... There was no department store to go to. There were no, what? Um, what are the big stores? Costco's, there were no yeah, Costco's. No Sears, nothing, catalog. no Sears catalog. And so you may do with what you had. And there's something else that we've learned, um, particularly by a Canadian student, uh, Cynthia Timoan, who did a master's thesis on our stones, on our ground stones. And she talks about different categories of stones, the larger ones, and we'll come to these in a minute, but these larger ones uh, were cut out of their sources, and they had to go quite a ways from central Jordan to get to the sources uh, up in north Jordan, uh, the mm -hmm, desert, mm -hmm. or even toward the Dead Sea, you could mm -hmm. get them there. Um, and there would be caravaneers who would pick up these large stones, bring them up, work them, uh, well, they would work them as much as possible at the site because you don't want to carry the extra weight. Um, and then if one of these happened to break, or even if this, uh, this upper milling stone, we'll come back to this one, if it broke, you don't throw it away. Mm -hmm. You carve some 
something else out of it. And so these smaller ones are what uh, Cynthia Timon calls expedient tools. <laughs> um, you can't just go buy one. There were no stores to get them. And the trade was limited, at least in certain parts of uh, times. This one is a small mortar or bowl. Uh, we have some other bowls over here. Um, this, would, this would be for, fairly, for something fairly small. Mm -hmm. An interesting stone, not so much for ground stone tools, but for flint stools, uh, tools, mm -hmm. or for metal, mm -hmm. uh, a whetstone. Mm -hmm. Probably what? Is this sandstone or is this it a is. limestone? It's the sandstone. It's the sandstone. It's the, you can see all the grooves mm -hmm. that it, where things have been sharpened or shaped. Right, right. Like and then a mortar. These were the base for which these pestles were used with, with them. And then this one, this actually is my favorite. You asked me about the, these stones and <laughs> right. why they're my favorite. <laughs> this one's my favorite because, these two are my favorite, because this is the grinding stone, what we mm -hmm. now call a grinding stone. It would be the lower millstone in a domestic setting. <coughs> Whereas this is the upper millstone. Mm -hmm. um, we have lots of these. We called them loaf-shaped grinders mm -hmm. for a while. Um, but we now call them upper millstones. That's going to be important with uh, mm -hmm. one of the biblical texts that we'll be talking about. These would be used like this, back and forth, back and forth, with flour or legumes or whatever mm -hmm. to turn them into, uh, I'm sorry, with grain or legumes, turn them into flour or mm -hmm. powder of some kind. Uh, this is a, an interesting experiment. People really ought to do this mm -hmm. to, to experience what biblical characters had to do all every day. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You didn't want to do a whole lot. Mm -hmm. This is a tiring job. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people would sit, in fact, we have evidence at Amari mm -hmm. um, in the field that you excavated, mm -hmm. Kent, of people with a, with a grinding stone and a little bench, a stool, right here. So they would be sitting here and grinding. Most likely a woman's work mm -hmm. um, in terms of the food systems chain and so on. I like that the household would could take turns, couldn't they? Because yes. it might take hours to grind yes. the grain mm -hmm. for yes. the bread, mm -hmm. the daily bread. Mm -hmm. And so you're collecting that flour on the sides mm -hmm. along with the grit. Mm -hmm. So this is tasty, but <laughs> it has it has content, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sometimes the mineral content. Um, the next one here is what for how many decades we just automatically said was. Um, um, a stone for slings, mm -hmm. uh, a ballistica, mm -hmm. or um, I guess ballista, uh, it's, it's, it's spelled in different ways. But this one, <coughs> very nicely rounded, chipped round, um, made out of basalt, very heavy, could certainly do some damage mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in a significant sling throw. Um, but I think, I don't know that this is the case entirely, but I think as more women participated in archaeology, sensed the smooth edges, the, mm -hmm. the smooth parts of it, and said, no, this is a kitchen implement. And mm -hmm. so we started now referring to these much more often as pounders. Mm -hmm. So if they've got a smooth edge, we mm -hmm. typically think this was a kitchen implement. Mm -hmm. You know, if we look at Sennacherib's uh, reliefs back in Nineveh, we see regiments in the Assyrian army who were slingers. Mm -hmm. And I think the stones look a lot like <laughs> this. Uh, <laughs> so how about, since people really were careful not to throw anything away, how about multi-purposing? I mean, mm -hmm. if, if you were a soldier running through a city and you were still had work to do and you found somebody in somebody's kitchen, one of these, why not? Um, and if you were a housewife and your pounder had broken and you go out to a battlefield and you find a few of these, why not? This is illustrated by what's going on in Palestine now. That, that's the only weapon available to the young people who want to demonstrate, isn't it? Right, right. Mm -hmm. So that goes back to that uh, militaristic use mm -hmm. of this mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then a couple of bowls. Um, these bowls are... One of them is, in particular, very nice. Um, this one we excavated from the, the famous Forum House from the time of the judges. Um, and it has a very nice um, three legs. It's a tripod bowl. 
um, extremely nicely done, very fine uh, basalt stone, and probably could have been used quite easily to, to do some, mm -hmm. not pounding, but some grinding, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, primarily served as, um, as a serving dish. And another bowl here, this is not as nice as that one, um, but s served a similar function. And the uh, basalt is not as fine on this one either. Mm -hmm. So we have different qualities. So I think that <coughs> if one is looking for a favorite artifact, um, something that's tied to everyday life mm -hmm. and to mm -hmm. food systems and to the very business of survival, that these ground stone tools, especially my favorites here, mm -hmm. um, the lower and the upper milling stones. You know, I think that some of our viewers are going to be surprised at how many biblical texts there are that talk about this. We right. usually sort of uh, go right over them and without thinking about them, right. but you've gathered, gathered a few that are going to be I interesting. Have, Why I don't have. you show, share now, them? Now, when we were talking about lamps, uh -huh. lamps do show up right, a lot right. in the biblical record. Cooking pots, not so we much. Hunt for them. <laughs> we we well, like we hunt for cooking pots. <laughs> we right. we look we, we hunt for the text. Discover them. Right. We discover right. little work. Yeah. And and well, and the biblical writers, they lived with them all the time, so they didn't think that they were very special. Mm -hmm. We like them. They're mm -hmm. our favorites. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's look at a couple of texts. This one illustrates, I think, the. Um, the social stratification, uh, this is in the Egyptian bondage when mm -hmm. the Israelites are in Egypt and Moses comes and so on. And all the firstborn of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits upon his throne, so we're talking about high class, even to the firstborn of the maidservant who is behind the mill. Mm -hmm. And also, as we talked about in our, on our site, sitting. Yep. So the, the pharaoh sits on his throne, the maidservant sits on a different kind of throne, mm -hmm. uh, on this little bench, mm -hmm. and grinds the milk. Those are the two poles, I guess, of the social They seem to mm -hmm. be, mm -hmm. and that illustrates that while milling is important, it's very much down, it's mm -hmm. very hard work, and mm -hmm. it's, down mm -hmm. the, uh, mm -hmm. it's down the ladder mm -hmm. uh, quite a distance. Um, I'm not exactly sure where this is from. I think it's from somewhere in Palestine. Mm -hmm. Um, an illustration of uh, a woman uh, now grinding and, and maybe even turning some of this into bread. Mm -hmm. So people have debated about the exact significance of this. And then a passage in Isaiah, um, one of the prophets. I'm not going to go through the Bible in order. I'm rather kind of doing this one thematically mm -hmm. as we think about it. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. So this is what is known as one of the oracles or speeches against the foreign nations. Mm -hmm. Almost all the prophets had these. Um, Hosea did not, but all the rest of the prophets had these. And so here's one of Isaiah's. You shall no more be called tender and delicate. Okay, so now we're looking for a transition from tender and delicate, daughter of Babylon. We're talking high class, somebody who was cared for, somebody who had people providing good food and easy, and easy access to, to the best food and so on. Take the millstones and grind meal. Well, this, is the, this is the princess. This is somebody from high in uh, the social, on the social ladder. You now need to go and grind grain. Um, put off your veil, strip off your robe, uncover your legs. This actually is a very demeaning text and goes on and gets more so uh, in parts that I did not quote. So this is a way of saying that the daughter of Babylon moves from this life of ease to hard work mm -hmm. and to grinding. So we have to think about biblical times and that this was not an easy thing to do. What do we do when we want a loaf of bread today? Where do we go? Just down to the corner market. Down to the corner market. <laughs> what do we do if we want some bread in antiquity? Grow the grain. <laughs> Harvest <laughs> day. You have to plan ahead, don't you? You do have to plan ahead. So. Yeah. And, and, and grain and bread were such a, an important staple. But you look to the lower classes to get it ready for you if you're in the upper class. If you, you are in the upper class, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. This is hard work. Mm -hmm. Uh, another passage, this one is interesting in that it's part of the legal code of ancient Israel and it had to do with the millstone, especially the upper one. No man shall take a mill or an upper millstone in pledge, for he would be taking a life in pledge. So 
if I have this in my home and I owe somebody something, that person can come and, and, and ask for something and pledge that I will pay back what I owe. But not this. I'm not supposed to you give this. You need that on a daily basis. I need though. this on a daily basis, and this is a source of life. Mm -hmm. So it may be low on the socioeconomic scale of labor, um, but it is basic. It's mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. So grinding stones, I mean, now when we excavate these things, this is life. Mm -hmm. This is the source of survival mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, for the ancients. So biblical time, if we're thinking biblical, if we're thinking about life in biblical times, we are thinking about survival mm -hmm. using these. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that connection, I think, is extremely rich. Um, this one is a fun one, sort of. I mean, nothing in Judges is really fun. I don't <laughs> think we can call it that. But in the book of Judges is the story of Abimelech. And at the end of the story, a certain woman through an upper millstone, the upper one here, okay, uh, upon Abimelech's head. She was in the town of Thebes, wherever that is, we don't know, um, somewhere in central Palestine, central, uh, the, the territory, the hill country that became Israel. Uh, and she was in a tower, and Abimelech had brought some brush around the tower and started it on fire. And um, everybody had gotten up into the tower, and so he was going to smoke them out, burn them out. Um, but a woman, a crafty woman, mm. has one of these in her hand. Why did she pack that up the <laughs> stairs? Or maybe she found it up on the tower, I don't <laughs> know. And she dropped it on his head. Um, well, and so when it landed on his head, it crushed his skull. He called quickly to the young man, his armor bearer, and said to him, draw your sword, kill me, lest men say of me, a woman has killed him. <laughs> and one of the reasons we remember Abimelech is because he was killed by a, a woman, woman dropping a stone <laughs> on his head. The thing he feared. The thing he feared the most. <laughs> Men and women. Right. Uh, I've read that story. Um, we've thought a lot about this. 3,000 years. Uh, that's right. <laughs> now, Doug, as director of the project in Jordan, <laughs> Every year, you go through a little ceremony. We, we do, um, and the ceremony is illustrated in this slide from the top of uh, our partially restored house, our home. Um, these are women on the dig, one particular year. I don't remember which year it was, somewhere in the 2000s. Um, and we have an annual um, um, Reenactment. millstone <laughs> toss. And the target is Abimelech. Abimelech is not right below, he's out of ways, and Abimelech is a watermelon. Um, and it's uh, a face of Abimelech is uh, drawn on it and so on. And the women of Thebes now throw the millstones um, onto Abimelech and try to, uh, to, to reenact the story. <laughs> now, this became such a thing because uh, there are authors who have written that women could not carry a, um, upper an upper millstone <laughs> up on the top of a tower and drop it. Well, we've got them. We've got lots of right. these things. We're thinking and of the big business Right, here right. <laughs> right. And, and we will be talking about a couple of those mm. uh, a bit later. But this is so illustrative <laughs> of a story that was a sad story. I mean, the Abimelech section, the Abimelech narrative, is very sad. It's, it's hubris, it's pride that's gone to seed, and he ends up dying in this really despicable way. But it's so... Okay, but it's a feminist it's, story. Uh, isn't well, it? Uh, of course, of course. <laughs> makes, well, a lot of stories in Judges, uh, well, at least at the beginning, uh, start that way. Another passage I like is from one of the prophets. What do you mean by crushing my people? He's addressing this to the wealthy merchant classes. Um, by grinding the face of the poor. And these are in parallel. That's how Hebrew poetry works. So uh, crushing my people, you could crush with one of these, I suppose, or a pounder, you could crush. Mm -hmm. But grinding the head of the poor with one of these stones. I mean, this is so graphic. This is wrong. It, it really is, and it captures people at a level that is extremely emotive, and mm -hmm. it's social justice. It mm -hmm. has to do with how mm -hmm. we treat the poor, mm -hmm. how we treat uh, those less fortunate. Mm -hmm. uh, the book of Matthew, this is maybe one that people will remember. Mm -hmm. um, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, or there are different translations for this word, maybe to stumble, 
uh, mm -hmm. is another word. And some people even think that the children are the, the new believers mm -hmm. um, in the Matthew community. Um, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck than to be drowned in the depth of the sea. That's harsh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe we should look to this kind of millstone. Uh, I'm not sure that this, well, maybe this would sink a person. Um, but but you, could tie, this, you could tie this something and round somebody's yeah. neck much Th these, easier. These are huge. This is about four feet across, three mm -hmm. and a half to four feet across, found in Capernaum mm -hmm. in, uh, in the Galilee. Jesus' own hometown. <laughs> Jesus' hometown, that's exactly right. Ah, even the, the second coming. Two women will be grinding at the mill, doing this. Um, one is taken, one is left. Watch for you don't know on what day your Lord is coming. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that this daily life activity has been drawn into mm -hmm. um, eschatology, into mm -hmm. expectation of uh, the advent. And that's, uh, we can't be too literal, can we? Because this isn't done much these days, but you can imagine two, two women in an office, uh, each right. on a computer, and one yeah. will be taken and one will uh, be left. That so, works so, just so we, as well, We have doesn't to change <laughs> that to fit right, our time, right. if we really want to capture mm -hmm. the flavor. And in this passage from the book of Revelation, then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea saying, so shall Babylon the great city be thrown down with violence and the sound of the millstone shall be heard in you no more. I mean, that says something about life, that mm -hmm. life basically has ended. Mm -hmm. And then the one more passage from the book of Jeremiah, which frames it negatively, but I think we have something positive. Moreover, I will banish from them the voice of mirth, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, the grinding of the millstones and the light of the lamp. So these were partly celebrative and they're gone in the destructive context, which means that they are a symbol of life and well-being. Yeah, so the millstone and its sound is something that uh, symbolizes it that. It is, and Larry, your favorite uh, artifact, the even lamp, the light the even lamp. happens to show up in here as well. I want to thank you, Kent and Larry, and all of you for joining us for this edition of Excavating the Bible. We hope we've provided something for you to think about and something for your soul, and we look forward to next time. Until then, think ancient, Keep believing and keep exploring. For Excavating the Bible, I'm Doug Clark.